Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to be merciful like the Heavenly Father, and have told us that whoever sees you sees him. Show us your face, and we will be saved. Your loving gaze freed Zacchaeus and Matthew from being enslaved by money, the adulteress and Magdalene from seeking happiness only in created things, made Peter weep after his betrayal, and assured paradise to the repentant thief. Let us hear, as if addressed to each one of us, the words that you spoke to the Samaritan woman. If you knew the gift of God, you are the visible face of the invisible body, of the God who manifests his power above all by forgiveness and mercy. Let the church be your visible face in the world, its Lord risen and glorified. You will that your ministers would also be clothed in weakness, in order that they may feel compassion for those in ignorance and error. Let everyone who approaches them feel sought after, loved and forgiven by God. Send your spirit and consecrate every one of us with this anointing, so that the jubilee of mercy may be a year of grace from the Lord, and your church with renewed enthusiasm may bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to captives and the oppressed, and restore sight to the blind. We ask this through the intercession of Mary, Mother of Mercy, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Well, again, good evening, everyone. Welcome this evening. You know, Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. These words might well sum up the mystery of the Christian faith. Mercy has become living and visible in Jesus of Nazareth, reaching its culmination in him. These very words, they come from the first paragraph of Misericordia Gultus, Pope Francis' document for the extraordinary jubilee of mercy. And he goes on to write in this document, the mission Jesus received from the Father was that of revealing the mystery of divine love in its fullness. God is love, St. John affirms for the first and only time in all of scriptures. This love has now been made visible and tangible in Jesus' entire life. His person is nothing but love, a love given gratuitously. The relationship he forms with the people who approach him manifests something entirely unique and unrepeatable. The signs he works, especially in the favor of sinners, the poor, the marginalized, the sick, and the suffering, are all meant to teach mercy. Everything in him speaks of mercy. Nothing in him is devoid of compassion. That's the end of the quote from that document. But most clearly, mercy reached its culmination in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus where the heart and the mercy of the Father was on full display for the whole world to see. Here this evening to help us reflect upon the connection between the cross of Jesus Christ and mercy is Father Tim Hoyg. Father Hoyg grew up in Philip, South Dakota. He's the youngest of six children. After high school, he attended the Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary in Winona, Minnesota. From there, he went on to the Pontifical um, College Joseph Reenum in Columbus, Ohio. His most recent academic endeavors have been um, at St. Paul University in Ottawa, Canada, where he studied canon law. So he holds a, a, a BA in philosophy, a master's in divinity, a master's in canon law, and a license in canon law. He is a really smart priest. He enjoys parish work, pheasant hunting and spending time with his uh, brother priest. But he was ordained uh, for this diocese um, back in 1995. And so over the course of his time as a priest, he served as parochial vicar 
at um, the cathedral. He was the chaplain of the Rapid City's Catholic Schools, he served as pastor of Christ the King in Prescio, St. Anthony's in Draper, St. Martin's in Murdo. Um, he was at St. Joseph's in Spearfish and St. Paul's in Belfouche. He served as the chaplain of the Black Hill State University Newman Center. He served as a diocesan location director, one of our deans. He served as a member of the Diocesan Presbyterian Council. And now he's at St. Patrick's in Wall, St. Margaret's in Lakeside, and Holy Rosary in the Interior. Um, but he's also the judicial vicar of the Diocese of Rapid City, where he is in the care of the Diocesan Marriage Tribunal. So he's been a busy man these last many years. So we welcome him. Give us love. Let's give him a warm welcome. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Father Steve for, and the uh, Year of Mercy Committee for allowing me to switch places with him. I was slated to speak in September, and he is slated to speak today. But after I agreed to that, I realized sometime later, about a month ago, that I would actually be in Ireland during that time. And so he uh, graciously switched with me. I just want to begin with um, this reading from Matthew. From then on, Jesus, the Messiah, started to indicate to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly there at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be put to death and raised up on the third day. At this, Peter took him aside and began to remonstrate him. May you be spared, Master. God forbid that such a thing should ever happen to you. Jesus turned on Peter and said, Get out of my sight, you Satan. You are trying to make me trip and fall. You are not judging by God's standards but by man's. Jesus then said to his disciples, If a man wishes to come after me, he must deny his very self, take up his cross, and begin to follow in my footsteps. Now this invitation that Jesus gives us to deny our very selves, to pick up our cross and follow after Him, is really, I've come to see, an invitation to His mercy. It's an invitation to know His, his great love for us. And that's what I want to speak a little bit about tonight. And to do that, I'm just going to tell you some stories from my own life and how I've kind of come to see these things. And I hope along the way to be able to give you some practical suggestions that you might, that through them you might find, you might be able to be a little more open to God's mercy in your own life. That's the idea. I think that in order to be able to accept our cross, the cross of our human nature, denying ourselves, and following in His footsteps, there's three fundamental sort of prerequisites that, that go along with that. One is a sustained experience of God's love. And the second, acceptance of our weaknesses. And third, surrender. Surrender to the cross. 
And I wouldn't be great if I could say I just came to that one day. But actually, not so. You know, when I was um, in Spearfish, I was pastoring Spearfish, I was, I was minding my own business, and I had a great life. I, 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 I was happy. Things were mostly okay. And um, the bishop came and asked me to go study canon law. And uh, my very first words to him were, uh, if you guys are asking me to go study canon law, you guys are scraping along the bottom of the barrel now. And he said, uh, well, um, well, we have asked other people, but no one has said yes. And so I took some time to pray about it. And in truth, in my own life, I needed a jump start in relationship to God. I, had, I needed a sabbatical. And so I had applied for one previous to this, and because I knew they were desperate, I had a little leverage to be able to ask for a sabbatical before going to study canon law. And I was granted that. And in truth, I really wanted to fall in love with God again. Not that I didn't pray, I did pray. But sometimes I didn't pray all the hours of my office. And sometimes I prayed all the hours of my office at one time, at the end of the day. And in general, I kind of just wanted to be in love with the Lord in the way I was when I was newly ordained without all the imprudence that came along with it at that time. And so when I went on, I went to Rome on sabbatical, and uh, sabbatical is the greatest kind of education because you go to class in the morning if you want to, there's no tests and no homework, and every afternoon is free. And uh, so I would go to class in the morning, and then in the afternoon I'd go out and wander around Rome, and every day, every day, I got lost. I go out and wander around Rome, and I got lost. And I, now I know that if I'm ever going to lead a pilgrimage to Rome, I've got to take somebody who can read a map and a compass, because it's not me. And, uh, you know, I'd go out, and I'd wander around, and I'd get lost. And, and after a while, I stopped worrying about it because I was on sabbatical after all. And getting lost, you know, at least it's good exercise. And so, as I was going through, um, I was really starting to, to pray for the grace to know God's love more. And I would go out and wander around Rome. And I started always ending up at this piazza called Piazza Navona, kind of where these artists hang out. And after a while, I knew that if I could find my way back there, and actually I found that Italians were more likely to give me accurate directions to there than they were to St. Peter's. And so I, if I could get my way back there, then I could almost always find my way home from there. And so I started spending a lot of time there and drinking coffee and watching these artists. And I started paying attention to these two types of artists. One was a caricature artist. And they almost always, this caricature artist almost always drew pictures of young men or groups of boys or a husband and wife maybe together. And he looked at their flaws their big chin or their nose or their bigger ears and he, he blew them out of proportion to this kind of goofy looking picture. But then there was also the portrait artist. And the portrait artist was different. He almost always painted girls and women. And if it was a young girl, he always made them look a little bit older. And if it was an older woman, he always made them look a little bit younger. And he always, he started with their eyes. And he, 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 he looked at their beauty. He looked for the ways that they were beautiful. And he accentuated their beauty and even made them more beautiful than they were. 
And as I was sitting there one day, watching that caricature artist, God kind of said to me, you know, you're like this artist. You look at your flaws, and you look at them to so much that you blow them out of proportion. Make them bigger than they are. But I, I don't think as humans do. I am like, I am the, I am the, I am like the portrait artist. When I look at you, I see your beauty first. I see what's good. I see what's strong. And I was struck there, I was sitting there drinking coffee and I realized that God was speaking to me. And I uh, made my way back home. And the next day a presenter came to, I don't know exactly what he was speaking of, but one of the things he said is he told a story about um, uh, uh, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta and one of, her, one of her houses in this poor country where they were running an orphanage and the kids really did not have good clothes to go to school. And so every morning the sisters would take each child bit one by one, take the boys and the girls and take the girls and stand them in the doorway and the sisters would say, now just stand there and let me see your beauty. And then step back and go, you are so beautiful. And they put the boys there and say, You are so strong, so handsome. And then they send them off to school clothed in their own beauty, clothed in their own strength. The speaker suggested that what we might do as priests is that we might, when we go to prayer, just put ourselves before God and let Him see your beauty. Just let Him take in your, your strength. And they said that when these children would stand in the doorway, and it was hard for them. They want to. They put their head down and they look at the shoes. They want to run away. They say, "No, no, you have to stay. To just allow me to take in your beauty." When we go before God and we sit before Him, um, it's a little uncomfortable because if you're like me, you're quick to look at your flaws, maybe even make them worse than they are. But God isn't like that. God doesn't think that way. He sees your beauty first. He sees what's good about you. He sees your strength. So that would be a practical thing I'd suggest as a way of opening yourself to God's mercy. It would be to put yourself in the presence of God and allow Him, when you go to pray, and allow Him to take in your beauty. And every time you're tempted to think about your flaw or your flaws or what's wrong, that's like those little kids looking at their shoes or wanting to run away. You just ask for the grace to just stay, stay there, and allow Him to admire your strength, to take in your beauty. It's what He sees. And then ask for the grace to see yourself as He sees you. And, you know, I would say, do that for a couple months or more. You know, these things are not like a silver bullet. I learned that too. I started doing that. And over time, a year, I'm not sure how, how long, I started to notice changes in the way I was thinking about things. You know, if, if up to that point, up to this point, you've been looking at your flaw, looking at yourself like the caricature artist for 30 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, you're probably not going to get over it in a couple of months. And so, you know, you can put yourself in God's presence and allow Him to look at your beauty and your strength 
and resist the temptation to run away. Allow him just to take you in. And when I did that for a while, I became, I started to, bit, little by little, I started to become more and more convinced of God's love for me. Little by little. Not that I was completely unconvinced before, and I knew it intellectually and theologically, but by doing that, I came to just have a kind of a sustained experience of God's love for me. I also came to see um, I came to see that once I could really be okay with the fact that God treasured me and made it possible for me to honestly take a look at my flaws. Not like the caricature artist. And not without regret, but just to see them. And in that, I, I received the grace, just by putting myself before God like that, I received the grace to know that God is not disappointed in me. Now somehow I had come to think that, I come to think that God was disappointed. One time in prayer, God kind of said to me, you know, this is not, this is another way that humans think that I don't think. I don't think that way. You know, the disappointment is the idea that we have a certain idea about somebody, and maybe it's something we created about them, this idea we have of them, or maybe it's a way that they sort of led, led us to believe. We have a certain idea about someone, and then we come to find out new information that tells us that this person is not who we thought they were, and in that surprise, we're disappointed. But for God, God is omniscient, right? He knows all things. So there actually is no surprises for God. Now, God can surprise us, but we don't surprise God. And because there's no surprises for God, there can be no disappointment. See? That would be another practical thing. But you don't allow the evil one to tell you that God is disappointed. He's not. He's not disappointed in you. He knows the truth. He sees you and I as we truly are. Beloved daughters and beloved sons of God. Who we truly are. Not who we tell ourselves who we are, not who the devil says we are, not who the world says we are. That we truly are his beloved sons and his beloved daughters who have human weaknesses, who he longs, who we have. he loves us as his beloved daughters and sons, and we have these human weaknesses which he longs for us to surrender to him. He longs for